So if we start off with a region that has area delta x delta y, and we apply some transformation, we know that the, the new area is going to be some stretching factor um, times delta x delta y. And we figured out that that stretching factor can be found by taking the determinant of the matrix of um, first derivatives, or the total derivative matrix for the transformation. That would be f sub 1 sub x and f sub 1 sub y, f sub 2 sub x, f sub 2 sub y. So this is really just the determinant of the first derivative matrix. Um, and let's see, so uh, oh, first derivative matrix of our vector valued function f of the transformation there. We, we use the, the j because this is uh, the Jacobian. Some, some people call the, uh, the first derivative matrix the total derivative, the Jacobian. Um, and so to be clear, they call this the Jacobian determinant, if that's the case. So watch out for Jacobian or Jacobian determinant. Just see which, which one is being used in the context before you um, jump to any conclusions. Now let's see. Now uh, another notation for this Jacobian um, determinant is we're really talking about changes in u and v as compared to changes in x and y. So this is another notation that's used for this Jacobian. So we have the partial of u and v with, by the partial of um, x and y. Kind of a, a strange notation, but it actually kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about this d as standing for differences, right? So differences and difference in area in the uv space as compared to difference in area, change in area in the xy space. Let's look at some applications here. So first, back to our polar coordinate transformation. This was a transformation that is starting with r and theta, and we're ending up with x and y over here. So our question is, if you have a little box of area over here that is delta r by delta theta, how big will the corresponding region be over here? So that's going to correspond to some kind of kind of keystone-shaped region. The smaller it gets, the smaller delta r and delta theta get, the more this looks like a little teensy tiny parallelogram. That was our, our whole argument there. Let's see, so we just have to find um, the partial of x and y with respect to r and theta, which by that we meant we need to find um, the determinant of this matrix of first partials. Let's see. X is our cos and theta, so the derivative of x with respect to r is cos and theta, and the derivative of x with respect to theta is minus r sine theta. The derivative of y with respect to r is sine theta, and the derivative of y with respect to theta is r cos and theta. So our determinant turns out to be r cos squared theta minus minus r sine squared theta which would be r times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta if I factor out that common r. And cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is 1, so this is just equal to r. So if we have a region that's um, delta r by delta theta, so if its area is delta r delta theta over here in our theta space, its region over here is going to be r delta r delta theta. Now technically it should be the absolute value of r, um, but to avoid having to work with absolute values, we'll always try to um, to describe our region using positive radiuses. So when we're doing this kind of transformation, typically we'll have some kind of shape that has a, that we want to do an integral over, but it will have a nice expression in um, in polar coordinates. And so we'll just try to express it using positive r. Remember, there was there were multiple representations when we when we express things in polar coordinates. But anyway, there's our Jacobian, right? And that's r, and we just have to take the absolute value of the Jacobian. Of course, if we set it up so that r is positive in our bounds, then we can just do r delta r delta theta. As the point is that the stretching factor is the absolute value of r. Now, if things here get stretched by a factor of r, then going back, so everything gets stretched by r this way, then if you were to find the reverse transformation that takes points x and y and turns them into coordinates r and theta. So if you were to, to find the inverse transformation there, everything is going to get smashed by a factor of 1 over r, right? That would be 
1 over the Jacobian. So we, we calculated our Jacobian, well, we calculated our Jacobian this way, right? So you get stretching factor this way. To get the, the stretching factor the opposite direction, you could always just use 1 over r. We could even express that, since we were starting off in x and y space, we could express that in terms of x and y, since r is, um, or the absolute value of r is definitely um, the square root of x squared plus y squared. So we, c we get our stretching factor back this way in terms of x and y, if we like. Now, usually, um, when people find the stretching factor for polar coordinate transformations, they don't bother to write out that first derivative matrix, um, although it is interesting. What they argue is, okay, let's say I'm here, I have this little tiny box, and it has some width delta r and some height delta theta. Um, and let's see, we're at an angle of about, of about 2, huh, and a radius of about 1, so we're over here with an angle of 2. If you make a small change in r, that just moves you straight out from the origin, right? On the other hand, if you make a change in theta, that moves you over, initially perpendicular to that change in r. Now, how much you move out will be equal to the change in radius, right? But how much you move over, when you have an angle, right, changing the angle gets multiplied by the radius. So this moves you over an amount r delta theta. So if you look at that little keystone, it's basically r delta theta by delta r. And these two are, are essentially perpendicular because moving out, changing r, is perpendicular to turning. And so we can just multiply them to get the area. So we start off with something that has area delta r delta theta over here. And when we're done, we end up with something that's yeah, roughly a parallelogram. And it has area r delta r delta theta. So that's just a common derivation there. They can do that because. Um, when you make changes in r and changes in theta over here in xy space, they're perpendicular, and so you can just multiply them. Let's do another example. We had this transformation before. There was this complicated parallelogram, and our transformation turned it into a nice rectangle. In fact, it turned it into a nice square. And we want to know if we have a tiny patch of area over here, that's going to get transformed to some patch of area there. And our question is, What's the stretching factor? So to find the stretching factor, we're talking about the Jacobian, which is the determinant of, we'll take the derivative of u with respect to x, which is uh, negative 1, and the derivative of u with respect to y is 1, and the derivative of v with respect to x is 1 half, and the derivative of v with respect to y is 1. So for our determinant, we get uh, negative 1 minus a half. So negative 1 minus a half would be negative 3 halves. Now we see, if we just want to know the stretching factor, we don't care about the negative sign, right? We just care about the area of the result. So what we, for our actual stretching factor, we always take the absolute value of the Jacobian because we just want to know how much our thing stretched. What's the correct conversion factor? So that makes 3 halves for our Jacobian. So any region over here right, will be stretched to a region that is 50% larger, right? It's going to be stretched by a factor of 3 halves. On the other hand, if you had a region here, that would become some region back over here, right? If everything gets stretched by 3 halves as you go over, everything should get smashed by 1 over 3 halves, right? Which is 2 thirds. So we, we could say that the, the um, Jacobian du dxy is 3 halves, and the one that compares changes in xy spaces to changes in the original uv is going to be 2 thirds. You see the notation for the Jacobian in, in this sense. Um, we have, we're, we're changing from x to u, and so we have u and v, on, xy to uv, so we have u and v on top and xy on the bottom, that's because we're moving from xy to uv. When we're going from uv to xy, then we have x and y on top and u and v in the bottom for our transformation. Um, when you have a linear transformation, and so if u and v are both just constants times, um, 
times the variable, so there's nothing nonlinear in this. Then, of course, these derivatives will all be constants, and so the Jacobian will be constant. So everything gets stretched by the same factor in a linear transformation, as opposed to a nonlinear transformation like the polar transformation, where things got stretched by some variable factor r. Here's, a, here's a, another nonlinear transformation. Remember, we saw that this region was transformed to this nice uh, square with this transformation. And um, let's see, um, we want to find the Jacobian, which we're talking here about duv dxy, right? That will be the stretching factor for converting from xy to uv. So we take the derivative of u with respect to x is 1, the derivative of u with respect to y is 0, the derivative of v with respect to x is y, and the derivative of v with respect to y is x, and our determinant just turns out to be x minus, let's see, 1 times x minus 0 times y just turns out to be x. So we have this stretching factor of x. So that would mean if you were going to go the other way, so here, tiny boxes get multiplied, their area gets multiplied by a factor of x coming over here. And so going back, if you have a tiny area here, it gets transformed to some funny shape over here that's, if it's small enough, it's roughly a parallelogram, then it's going to um, get smashed by a factor 1 over x. Of course, if you're starting out with something in uv, it'd be nice to have the stretching factor in terms of where you are. But in this case, the transformation said x is u, so the stretching factor is just 1 over u, if you write it in that sense. So duv dxy, or the Jacobian for this forward direction, was x. Going the opposite direction, that Jacobian is 1 over x, which according to our transformation is the same as 1 over u.